everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, for everybody. Uh, I'm Flavia Machado. I am an intensivist uh, working in Sao Paulo, professor of clinical care at the Federal University uh, of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And uh, I want to welcome uh, everybody on this session where we are going to discuss uh, very nice studies that were published in our field. So this is the 16th session of the World Sepsis Congress and uh, the last session, and I hope that you all will enjoy it a lot. Uh, we have very nice speakers with us uh, in this session, and uh, please be very welcome to put your questions in the chat. Each, speak, each speaker, we're going to answer these uh, uh, questions uh, uh, after their talks. And uh, just to spare our time, I just want uh, to welcome uh, you, uh, Dr. Kusan Menon. Dr. Kusan Menon will going to talk us about why criteria for diagnosing pediatric sepsis and the social determinants of health matters. Uh, Dr. Uh, Menon is a pediatric intensive care physician and researcher in the Children's Hospital in Western Ontario and professor of pediatrics. Uh, in epidemiology on the University of uh, Ottawa. Her research focused primarily on the adrenal access and the use of hydrocortisone on pediatric sepsis, but she has been a principal investigator of many trials, uh, including trials on uh, the use of cortisone. She is currently the vice chair of the Canadian Clinical Care Trials Group and a steering committee member for the Sepsis Canada. She's also a member and the lead methodologist of the Pediatric Sepsis Definition Task Force. Uh, to, uh, she is very interested on the whole of the social determinants of health uh, and outcomes in children with sepsis. Please be very welcome, Dr. Menon. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm very pleased to be here and thank you for that lovely introduction, Flavia. To begin with, I just want to remind everybody, as everyone here knows, that sepsis affects up to 50 million people worldwide yearly, and at least 11 million of those people die. Almost half of these cases occur in children, resulting in approximately 3 million deaths. Mortality in children and sepsis varies from 5 to 40 percent, depending on the setting with the result that sepsis is the leading global cause of mortality in children. When you look at these statistics and numbers, you have to wonder, how do we get these numbers? Where do they come from? Are they accurate? So this raises the question of why there is a necessity for sepsis criteria, that we can't simply say the word sepsis, but we need to define it and we need to know what we're talking about. This is important to have consistent criteria for the recognition of sepsis, management of it, benchmarking of management of sepsis and the outcomes in similar settings, and to conduct research on new therapies for this very serious condition. The incidence of sepsis is likely underestimated due to different definitions used, clinical difficulties in diagnosing sepsis, and variation in hospital coding practices. The results of discrepancies in the definitions used is nicely illustrated in this 2019 adult study in which mortality rates were compared using two different definitions. One was clinical criteria and the other were hospital sepsis codes. The variation in mortality using clinical criteria in the study ranged from five to 22.5%, whereas using hospital sepsis codes ranged from 12.5 to 37.5%, so a huge variation depending on the definition used. So that leads us to how we define pediatric sepsis. And before we go into that, we need to all understand, and we do, that sepsis is not a specific disease with a single etiology. In fact, it's a clinical syndrome, which is characterized by a variety of signs and symptoms, depending on what causes it and the timing of the patient's presentation. As such, it is difficult to identify, quantify, and develop protocols for the management of sepsis. So when you look at the criteria that are most commonly used currently for defining pediatric sepsis, there are three. 
The first was that from the Pediatric Sepsis Consensus Conference from 2005. And although there are many parts of these criteria that we could discuss, I just wanna highlight two, temperature and capillary refill. So in this definition, temperature is defined as hyper or hypothermia, which is greater than 38.5 or less than 36 degrees, and capillary refill time, which is defined as greater than five seconds. Keep this in mind as we discuss the two further definitions. Another definition that's commonly used is the American College of Critical Care Medicine definition. Here, temperature is defined as hyper or hypothermia, but it's defined qualitatively and no cutoff values are described. Capillary refill time is described as prolonged greater than two seconds instead of greater than five seconds as in the previous definition. Finally, the World Health Organization also uses temperature and capillary refill. However, temperature they only define using hyperthermia, which is greater than 39 degrees Celsius, and prolonged capillary refill time is greater than three seconds. So you can see there's a fair degree of variability in the three most commonly used pediatric sepsis criteria. So what are the requirements for sepsis criteria? If we think about these three definitions, why are they so different? Well, one of the issues that has arisen in the past is that we really need these the criteria to be evidence-based. Expert input is very important, but it's only one aspect. We need the criteria to be specific to children and not just derived from adults. Sepsis 3 is the most updated sepsis definition from 2016, but it's based on adult physiology and therefore probably has limited applicability to children. And finally, it's super important that we have a definition and criteria that are applicable to diverse settings. And one of the best ways to do this is to actually get broad-based expertise of clinicians and sepsis experts from around the world. So the Society for Critical Care Medicine commissioned a pediatric definition task force which is diverse geographic and professional membership and conducted a three-pronged approach, which is still ongoing. The first involved a survey of clin clinicians and received almost 3000 global responses. Clinicians identified that abnormal vital signs, laboratory evidence of inflammation and microbiologic diagnoses were the most used criteria by themselves. The second thing we did was to conduct a systematic review of variables that could be used in a definition and examine their association with clinically important outcomes. What we found was that in children with infection, decreased level of consciousness and higher PRISM scores were associated with development of sepsis. In children with sepsis, chronic conditions, oncologic diagnoses, use of inotropic agents, mechanical ventilation, serum lactate, platelet count, fibrinogen, procalcitonin, and each of the, of the illness severity scores demonstrated significant associations with mortality. Currently, we're undergoing the data validation phase of the project. This will analyze global sepsis databases to validate variables for use in the definition, along with the results of the variables identified in the survey and the systematic review. All three of these will then be incorporated into a Delphi process by the expert panel to then come up with recommendations for an updated sepsis definition in children. One of the things and considerations that arose while doing this process was, what do the social determinants of health contribute to this process? How do they affect the definition and how do we potentially incorporate them? As a reminder, the social determinants of health are non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. According to the World Health Organization, they are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. They are very important to help us understand the role these factors play in the development and severity of sepsis, compare and extrapolate sepsis study results between settings, and implement policies aimed at improving socioeconomic conditions related to sepsis. The social determinants of health have an important influence on health inequities, importantly seen within and between countries. To further drive home this point, in our systematic review, we looked at sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock mortality rates across income classifications from the World Bank. 
And we found that in all three of them, higher um, socioeconomic status is classified by high income country, had a lower mortality for sepsis, severe sepsis and septic shock. However, it's really important to remember that World Bank income classifications are a very crude marker for social determinants of health and don't give us the granularity of what some of the important factors are that could be modifiable. This is illustrated by looking at a high income country such as Canada and looking at one of the very important social determinants of health, which is access to care. Canada is a very geographically large country and you can see that more than 6 million Canadians live in rural communities, which are beyond commuting distance of large urban centres, and that 200,000 Canadians live in remote communities with almost no access to direct access to medical care. Importantly, half of the Indigenous peoples in Canada live in rural or remote communities, again highlighting how there is limited access to health care for some populations, even within high-income countries. We conducted a, a scoping review of social determinants of health in pediatric sepsis studies and found that social determinants of health other than gender, sex, and our weight are not commonly reported. Furthermore, that these studies use 24 different nutritional measures and no two studies use the same definition of a given measure. In addition, they use different categories to classify race and ethnicity, and most did not report the definition or method used to determine these categories. This is further illustrated in this table where you can see that patients who are classified as white could be white, white European, non-Hispanic, Caucasian, Dutch Caucasian. Similarly, somebody from the Indian subcontinent could be classified as Asian, Asian slash Indian slash Pacific Islander, et cetera, or as Hindustani again, making it very hard to compare between settings or between studies. So in conclusion, we all know that sepsis is a serious clinical condition for which there's no diagnostic test. Consensus criteria are needed for early recognition and prompt treatment, research on new therapies, and population health evaluation to better understand the role of social determinants of health in sepsis. Furthermore, standardization of definitions of social determinants of health are also needed in order to make policy statements and compare between settings. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Menon, for this uh, wonderful talk on, on such an important and relevant issue. We know about, uh, we know that pediatric sepsis is a burning issue and um, uh, very important to, to, to point out everything. So I I, uh, I uh, have a question for you. Uh, it's uh, uh, what is the way to go? What should we do uh, to uh, uh, get a better data on pediatric sepsis? And I add to this question the comment that we run in Brazil, the spread in pediatric ICU. So we did a uh, one-day prevalence study uh, in Brazilian ICUs, in a random sample of Brazilian ICUs, and we faced all the issues that we you so nicely discussed uh, with how to collect the data on social determinants of health, even in our country, in a middle-income country, with a good uh, research structure, it was almost impossible to have this sort of data. So I, I, I would add this, this question uh, that uh, we, we, we felt the difficulties to have uh, to have data on this, and how can we manage this? It, it's a really good question, Flavia. And I think, you know, these things take time for us to get consensus, but I think it's important. And I think the, a similar process to what we're doing with the sepsis definition task force, I think could be very helpful for social determinants of health in pediatrics. And I think there are a lot of experts in this across the world and pulling together a task force not just from critical care, but from different areas within pediatrics, I think would be an ideal way to start and to have different perspectives and different people come together to break down the different categories and variables within the World Health Organization and classifications to come to a consensus of how do we make a, a system that will be relevant to individual countries, but will also allow us to compare at least some of these variables across countries. 
um, you know, socioeconomic markers vary from country. You can't use income levels because you have to compare dollars. But how do how do you do that? So I think those are things that it will take time. But I do think it's actually doable. And I think the world is becoming a smaller place. We're learning very well how to collaborate. And there's been so many examples in pediatrics of great um, collaborations. So I think we can do this. And I think we just have to decide that it's important and put together a group that will start to work on it and modify it over time till it meets the needs of both clinicians as well as researchers and um, policymakers. Yeah, that, that was really a very good uh, answer and approach because when you said that social income will not, measuring social income will not solve our problem, you're right, because what we can buy with one dollar in um, sub-Saharan Africa is totally different, but what we can buy with one dollar in Brazil or even less in Europe or the United States. So it is a pretty, pretty big challenge. And what do you think is going to happen, uh, Dr. Menon? Because uh, after all, when we start, start to collect data, all the data that we have now on the epidemiology of sepsis, how, how can we deal with the differences? Because we are facing this now with the adults. Uh, as we change the definition, we change the epidemiology of sepsis. And <laughs> so... Uh, in a way, it would be better for the pediatrics, isn't it? Because you're starting or restarting, uh, building up in a new definition that might be better than uh, what we used before. Um, it, again, that's a very good question because we don't want to lose the data that we've had from the past because I think that's important and we need to look at the past to be able to compare. And while different definitions have definitely given us different incidents, different prevalence, different mortality rates. There is still over time a trend that we are able to use and compare. Starting from scratch, you're right, it's going to set the bar again to a new definition, which not everybody's going to use right away. And, you know, there's still going to be variability, but hopefully in 5, 10, 15 years, we'll start getting more consistency and having people use and seeing the benefits of using a common definition. And we hope that the process that we've used to develop this definition will make it usable in multiple different settings because we've been very conscious to not include things in the definition that may not be available everywhere or to have different levels of um, what can be included depending on your resource setting. So to, for example, ask for procalcitonin in sub-Saharan Africa or Northern Canada is going to be unrealistic. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't define sepsis. So we're hoping to have a bit of a progressive definition. And once people see that it's been developed with a lot of diverse input and see the value of, or hoping that over time they will be consistent in that from time zero now, we can at least collect consistent new data, but still acknowledge that there's a lot of valuable old data, even if it is variable. And actually, a last question, because we have a, a question on the chat. I think you addressed it already, but maybe you want to compliment, uh, to, 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 to add something. It's uh, what we can do to make an agreement of definition of sepsis in pediatric patients. I think you covered it, but it may, maybe you want to make a last comment. Um, so we hope to have the Pediatric Sepsis Definition Task Force um, update by January of 2024, so very soon. Um, and hope to spread that around. Um, and hopefully by then, you know, people will start to see it, use it, ask us questions, and hopefully it's flexible enough and has taken in broad enough input and the, the data as well as opinions such that people will buy into it and we will be able to start with something that there's consent, overall consensus on. So thank you so much, Dr. Menon, for your participation. Wonderful lecture. Uh, and uh, we are going to move on on the next speaker for uh, this session. Uh, it's, uh, it is that uh, we are going to welcome Dr. Katherine Hyde. Uh, she, uh, we're going to speak up about a very burning issue, which is the timing for source control uh, in our septic patients. Uh, Dr. Hyde is the uh, general surgical uh, resident and a vascular surgery fellow uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. And during her medical training, uh, she, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship 
founded by N uh, NIH, and she has been working to bridge this uh, research interest in critical care medicine and surgical departments. And certainly, source control is one of the burning issues in this interaction with the surgeons. Uh, so she is also uh, collaborating in research and plans to keep going with this very important uh, issue on our patients. So be welcome, Dr. Uh, Hates. Thank you for the introduction. Sepsis is common and deadly. No surprise to this forum, infection, visualizing the red dots on the right, is the leading cause of death of all ages. Among hospitalized patients with sepsis, one in five do not survive to discharge. As a result, sepsis research is common and has been rapidly increasing over the last 100 years. There are over 200,000 publications in PubMed investigating sepsis and they have advanced the field. These published data culminate into the Surviving Sepsis Campaign's guidelines in uh, the treatment recommendations for sepsis. A major focus of these recommendations includes rapid identification and treatment of sepsis. For example, time to antibiotics within one hour of sepsis onset is graded as a strong recommendation. So at this forum, we all know, prompt treatment for patients with sepsis is important. However, our patients are still dying. What other factors need to be considered and how else can we improve patient outcomes? Source control is a key step in early sepsis treatment and is defined as abscess drainage, infected or necrotic tissue debridement, ongoing microbial contamination control, or the removal of infected devices. Source control is common for sepsis. One third of patients hospitalized with sepsis undergo such procedures. However, of the 200,000 publications investigating sepsis, less than 1% are related to source control. So due to a lack of high quality data and available prior to 2021, controversy exists surrounding how rapidly source control must be achieved. Prompt identification of septic foci and source control is left without a grade, but only a best practice guideline suggesting it should be occur as soon as medically and logistically possible. So to address this knowledge gap, we studied the electronic health record data from UPMC, which is an integrated healthcare system, including 14 hospitals, which are both academic and community, to, dis to evaluate the association between the timing of source control and the adjusted mortality in community-acquired sepsis. We hypothesized that early source control will be associated with a reduction in post-intervention mortality when compared to delayed source control. We identified over 3 million hospital encounters, of which 200,000 were for community-acquired sepsis as defined by sepsis-3. We excluded patients with potential misclassification and left us with nearly 5,000 patients who underwent source control procedures within 36 hours of community-acquired sepsis onset. We defined early source control as occurring within six hours of sepsis onset, which was achieved in for about 1,300 patients, and the overall 90-day mortality for the cohort was about 14%. Time to source control varied across patient characteristics. As expected, younger patients, more critically ill patients, and those receiving antibiotics more quickly all underwent source control procedures more rapidly. After accounting for a priori model covariance, we found early source control was associated with a 29% reduction and the adjusted odds of 90-day mortality. Further, each hour that source control was delayed increased, it was associated with an increased 2% risk of the adjusted uh, odds of 90-day mortality. These findings were extended to demonstrate 24% and 34% reduction in in-hospital and one-year mortality. So our immediate next question was, do these associations between early source control and improved outcomes vary amongst subgroups? We started with patient factors. Early source control demonstrated the greatest risk reduction amongst younger patients, especially those 35 to 54, but not older patients. The benefits of early source control were not significantly uh, different across races. However, early source control demonstrated a greater benefit for men when compared to women. Further, those patients who are most critically ill, as defined by the highest, highest SOFA score category, benefited the most from early source control. 
Therefore, the greatest reduction in the adjusted mortality risk was observed amongst the youngest, the males, and the most critically ill patients. These findings are not surprising to us and are supported by other work. Older patients lack physiologic reserve. Among sepsis patients and those undergoing surgical interventions, frailty is known to be independently associated with an increased risk of adverse events. Um, therefore, um, the younger patients who have physiologic reserve can handle the stressor of the surgical intervention and therefore are actually demonstrating the benefit of the early source control. We were, however, surprised to uncover that early source control appeared to be um, greater for men when compared to women. There are obviously biologic differences between men and women, um, but there are also data to suggest that women are less likely to receive prompt care and to undergo fewer surgical interventions when compared to men. Therefore, a combination of sex-specific, biologic, as well as clinician bias may contribute to these differences, and certainly more work is needed to understand the relationship between sex and sepsis care. Finally, the most critically ill patients benefited the most from early source control. These data support the clinician's bias for those doctors and nurses at the bedside, seeing sicker patients and treating them more rapidly. What about hospital resources? Do these factors affect the association between source control and outcomes? Interestingly, the association between early source control and improved outcomes were consistently observed across hospital resources. This included patients who were transferred, those with and without mandated 24-hour surgeon availability, and those undergoing a highly stressful surgical intervention. Meaning it doesn't matter if you have to transfer your patient from another facility, you have to call and wake up your surgeon in the middle of the night from home, or if they need to undergo a major surgical intervention. Early source control within six hours appears to improve outcomes in these data, and it really is the time to treatment that's important. And finally, we asked, what about the procedures themselves? Is there an association between early source control and outcomes that differ across subgroups? And for, we isolated the most common procedures, those that occurred at least 500 times in our data set, and discovered amongst these, there was a 40% reduction in the mortality of early source, or the 40% reduction in mortality associated with early source control. And the magnitude of this reduction varied by procedure. To highlight a few and kind of imagine some clinical situations, you're in the emergency department, seeing a patient with right upper quadrant abdominal pain, fever, jaundice, their lab work and their right upper quadrant ultrasound uh, supports evidence of obstructing cholangitis. And for a patient like this one, a one-hour delay in source control for biliary decompression was associated with a 1% increase in 90-day mortality. Next, you see maybe an older patient with sepsis. They're confused, have a fever, and have some plank pain. Their urolysis and imaging is concerning for a complicated UTI with ureteral obstruction. Well, in this patient, a one-hour delay in the nephrostomy tube for source control is associated with a 3% increase in mortality, 90 days. Next, you see a patient with left lower quadrant abdominal pain. They're tachycardic, and maybe they have a new oxygen requirement. Their blood work demonstrates a leukocytosis, and their CT scan is concerning for diverticulitis with free fecal contamination. Again, prompt surgical evaluation is key. And amongst these patients, again, a one-hour delay in the time to source control was associated with a 3% increase in 90-day mortality. <clears throat> Finally, the largest benefit in our cohort um, from early source control was seen amongst patients with uh, soft tissue infections. You're now seeing any one of the three patients on the left with a soft tissue infection and sepsis. And for patients like this, again, just a one hour decrease and one hour delay in their time to source control is associated with a 4% increase in 90 day mortality. In summary, common amongst the common procedures, that uh, patients receive the highest benefit include gastrointestinal and abdominal procedures, urinary tract and biliary decompression, as well as soft tissue procedures. Our data puts real numbers behind the benefits or potential benefits for early source control, not only within the first six hours, but a significant increase for each hour that um, is delayed is associated with worse outcomes for these patients. So like all data, these data have limitations. They're retrospective and observational in nature and have 
on the ongoing potential for residual confounding. Are UPMC medical centers unique and potentially um, limiting our external validity? The quality and completeness of source control is unknown and probably one of the most important factors that are not quantified within these data. However, conducting a randomized control trial to obtain uh, data to evaluate the time to source control would not be feasible. It lacks equipoise. Therefore, our current data, which are not randomized, are still robust. We have adjusted for confounders, and we overcame the initial indication bias where the earliest, pa the sickest patients get the earliest care. So I hope with all of this, I can drive home that early source control is important and that more high quality research is required to advance guidelines for source control and sepsis. Thank you so much, Dr. Heitzschild. So, it was a wonderful and is a wonderful paper. Congratulations. I think it is quite important to uh, highlight the issue of uh, source control. And for us, intensivists, this is very important because many times we have problems in convincing the surgeon uh, that the patient is stable enough to go for a surgeon. So, your data on SOFA score, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's quite an effort for us to convince that uh, we should go for a, a source control intervention. But uh, by country, uh, they also argue sometimes that uh, the literature is not all uh, uh, in favor of speed in source control. So can you elaborate a little bit more on uh, on this balance between stabilizing the patient on the ICU <clears throat> that needs source control, that is instable, that is in mechanical ventilation, under drugs, under basal pressures, and uh, uh, the timing for source control, do you think that the SOFA score can measure this? That's a very good question. Um, I certainly have been a part of patient care where we're worried about physically moving, moving the patient off of the table to another table will result in them arresting. So I don't think that the, the SOFA score can really fully capture those patients at the most extreme levels. However, I think our data really kind of drives home in the vast majority of patients. It really is the time to source control, just like the time to antibiotics, that makes the big difference in the long term. And those patients that are on the edge where we're not sure if it's safe enough to get them to the operating room probably fall outside of these data and are just so sick that, you know, independent of what we do, we might not be able to really save them. But hopefully, uh, we have started the path of creating data and creating evidence and a push to say it really is important to get source control quickly. Um, for the person who's just, um, you know, we're debating on whether or not it's safe, just go. Um, it really is important uh, to get the microbial control. Very good. And also another point is that uh, uh, when you measure and adjust all of these uh, multivariate models, uh, they, they are not certainly not perfect in adjustment. And uh, your data on transfer patients is quite interesting as well. But then we have a difference on uh, the data that come from high income countries and the paper that the, the, the data that come from our settings, because we do have a lot of problems with transfer patients. So we have data, for instance, coming from Brazil showing that transfer patients, they have a lower compliance to, uh, to the bundles. So uh, how can we deal with this mixed information between uh, the compliance with the bundles, the compliance with antibiotics, uh, and uh, what we are seeing on uh, the compliance with source control? Uh, get, making the question in another way, uh, how can we be sure that it's only timing of force control, control and what is in the interaction with the compliance with the other bundles of care and mainly with the adequacy of source control that we cannot measure? Yeah, I think our data sort of take away all of those um, nuanced factors that you're suggesting. In our model, we included time to source control, or excuse me, time to antibiotic. Um, and um, really, it's just kind of gets boiled down to the time. So when all things are equal, the time itself is very important. However, if you're not going to get equitable care because you have to be transferred and you know all the logistics that go into that, um, that 
really requires kind of a separate analysis and a, a separate investigation. And actually, our surgical cohort here at Pittsburgh is interested in understanding the um, optimization of emergency general surgery uh, procedures and the honestly, the majority of which are patients with sepsis um, and understanding when to transfer, who to transfer and how to break down the not only the protocol to make sure everyone gets good care, but really to say these are the people that do best when are moved and these are the people who do best when they just stay there and they get their full bundle in the emergency department where they land. So it's just evidence that additional work is needed on on this topic and hopefully inspiring other people to be interested in improving surgical outcomes for sepsis. <laughs> so you definitely inspired a lot of people with your work. Dr. Heitz, thank you so much for joining us uh, in this session. And we are going to move on on our next speaker. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to invite uh, Dr. Heli Prescott. Heli Prescott, uh, we're going to talk about the rapid, uh, sepsis, if, if the rapid sepsis treatment will or not increase the risk of antibiotic resistance. Dr. Prescott is Associated Professor uh, in Pulmonary and Clinical Care Medicine at the University of Michigan and on Ann Harbor Veterans Affairs Hospital. Uh, she is an expert in long-term outcomes and recovery after sepsis and COVID, but certainly also on quality improvement and the research on what impacts on sepsis survival. Uh, she is founded by the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs and the U.S. Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. She is a physician led for Michigan statewide sepsis quality improvement collaboration founded by the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Prescott, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this session. Hello, everyone. My name is Hallie Prescott. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the US. And it's my pleasure today to be speaking about does rapid sepsis treatment increase risk of antimicrobial resistance? Um, the work that I'll be sharing today was funded by the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and I've listed other disclosures on the slide. Shorter time to antibiotics has been consistently associated with improved survival from sepsis. Um, on this slide, I show four uh, recent larger high-quality observational studies, all showing that with each hour of delay in time to antimicrobials, there is increased risk for in-hospital mortality. Um, this association or impact has also been shown to be greater uh, in patients who are sicker or have higher illness severity, typically um, uh, essentially uh, based on patients who have shock or low blood pressure versus, on patients, versus in patients who are normotensive. Uh, clinical practice guidelines um, recommend prompt administration of antimicrobials. And in the US, prompt antimicrobial administration is further incentivized by performance measures, as well as state and national policies. However, sepsis diagnosis may be uncertain, uh, particularly early in a patient's presentation. Um, here I show three um, recent cohort studies that look at patients who present to the emergency department or are admitted to the intensive care unit with a tentative diagnosis of sepsis. And at these studies showed that at the end of the day, at the end of hospitalization, with everything that had sort of been learned over the course of that hospital stay, about a third of these patients were ultimately felt to have a non-infectious or non-bacterial cause um, of illness be more likely than bacterial infection. And so it's this issue of diagnostic uncertainty that's really led to concerns that our focus on faster time to treatment in sepsis could be driving antimicrobial overuse and resistance um, by ultimately treating patients who turn out to have a non-bacterial cause for illness. Um, and so across all these viewpoints, perspective, editorials shown here, they all raise this concern that time to antibiotic targets risk promoting overuse and antibiotic-associated harms, such as antimicrobial resistance. And so this concern has really led to an urgent unanswered question of, is the focus on early antibiotics and sepsis actually driving antimicrobial overuse? Because while there's been a lot of concern about this issue, there's been scant data to show that this is happening. 
So my collaborator, Vinny Liu at Kaiser Permanente, and I applied for a grant to answer this question of when hospitals shorten time to treatment for sepsis, is that change associated with rising antibiotic use or broader spectrum of coverage among the sort of larger population of patients at risk for infection? Um, this was a very large study. We um, uh, had 152 hospitals in our cohort. That included 130 hospitals in the U.S. nationwide veteran affairs healthcare system, as well as, well as 22 hospitals in the Northern California uh, Kaiser Permanente system. The exposure was the hospital-specific trend in time to antibiotics for sepsis during the study period from 2013 to 2018. And the outcome was the hospital-specific trends in antimicrobial use among the much broader population of patients admitted with potential infection. So that was specifically hospitalizations admitted through the emergency department with positive SERS criteria. In our cohort, we had 1.6, nearly 1.6 million at-risk hospitalizations, of which 273,000 met CDC surveillance criteria for sepsis. The exposure um, was measured using barcode medication administration time. So that's essentially when the nurse scans the barcode on the antibiotic, they span the patient's barcode, and they give the um, antibiotic. So that's really as close to ground truth as you can get. Um, barcode medication administration was used in all 152 hospitals in our cohort. <clears throat> However, there were a number of emergency departments did not use barcode medication administration. And for those hospitals, we used the physician order entry time in the emergency department with an estimated lag time from the antibiotic order to the administration. We found that on average, across all these hospitals, the average time to antibiotics declined by about nine minutes per year among patients meeting surveillance criteria for sepsis. As shown in this table, we did a number of sensitivity analysis, making different assumptions about time to antibiotics among those hospitalizations for whom we just had the order time, and also a number of different sensitivity analysis where we modeled those changes over time in different ways. And consistently across all these different analyses, we found that time to antibiotics decreased on average by about nine minutes per year, year upon year, across the six-year time period. However, the slope of change varied across our hospitals. So we had a third over here that had more steep declines in time to antibiotics, a third with modest declines in antibiotics, and a third who were relatively flat over the study period. When we looked at trends in this broader population of at-risk hospitalizations, we found that the proportion treated with antimicrobials within 12 hours increased slightly. But when we zoomed out and looked at cumulative proportion treated within 48 hours, we saw that that actually declined slightly over the study period. There was more marked decline in the average days of therapy uh, among all 1.6 million at-risk hospitalizations, about a 0.5 decrease in total days of antimicrobial therapy including what was prescribed in hospitalization as well as antibiotics prescribed at discharge for the patients to complete at home. We also found that there was declines over time in the proportion of patients treated with broad-spectrum antimicrobial coverage either initially or at any point during their hospitalization episode. So this was very positive evidence that actually the overall burden of antimicrobial use was declining over the study time period. We then took this analysis one step further to understand the correlation between these hospital trends in sepsis and these hospital trends in overall antimicrobial use in at-risk patients. Um, so specifically for this, we um, looked at the hospital-specific trends in timed antibiotics for sepsis and asked how those associated with hospital-specific trends in antimicrobial use days of therapy, and broadness of coverage, really trying to get at whether these steeper declines in time to antibiotics for sepsis were associated with antimicrobial overuse or impaired stewardship. And we looked at the relationship between these trends using two different methods, Spearman correlations and associations from regress robust regression. We looked at a number of different outcomes for antimicrobial use in the at-risk population. And consistently, we found no association between these sepsis trends and the stewardship trends. Here, I'm going to show you one of these analyses um, visually. In this figure, 
Each dot represents one hospital in our cohort, and they are plotted along this x-axis based on their hospital trend over the study period in terms of average time to antibiotics for sepsis. So here is zero, and all the hospitals to the left of that are having shorter time to antibiotics for sepsis over time. And then on the y-axis, they're plotted based on their trend in overall antimicrobial use in the at-risk population. And so again, here is zero. That would be no change in antimicrobial use. And then as you go further down, that's greater declines in antimicrobial use. And I've highlighted here in green this lower left-hand quadrant of the figure. Those are hospitals that are simultaneously having shortened time to treatment for sepsis and decreases in overall antibiotic use in the at-risk population. Um, so these are hospitalizations with simultaneous improvement in sepsis care and simultaneous improvement in stewardship. These are traditionally thought to be kind of opposing forces. You have to sacrifice one for the other. And so this is a really important and optimistic message from the study that about 85% of hospitals in our cohort were able to make simultaneous improvements in stewardship and simultaneous improvements in shortening time to treatment for sepsis. So what are the main takeaways from this study? Faster timed antibiotics for sepsis did not drive indiscriminate antibiotic use in our study hospitals. Faster timed antibiotics for sepsis also did not appear to be impairing stewardship efforts. The key limitation of the study, which I will highlight, is that it was done in two healthcare systems that do indeed have strong antimicrobial stewardship programs. Um, so there is, of course, always the possibility that trends might look different in other hospitals that don't focus on antimicrobial stewardship. But nonetheless, I think this is a very positive message that stewardship and improvements in timing of sepsis care can coexist together. So what are the implications? It is possible to shorten time to antibiotics without driving overuse and without impairing stewardship efforts. This supports continued use <clears throat> of focusing on time to treatment for sepsis in terms of performance assessment and performance improvement. So I'll close with implications for bedside care and highlight this figure from the most recent Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. Um, these recommendations for antibiotic timing um, are stratified based on your assessment of how likely it is that the patient has sepsis, and then based on how sick the patient is. And so for patients that you believe have sepsis, sepsis is felt to be definite or probable, the recommendation is to administer antimicrobials immediately, ideally within one hour of recognition, because we know that delays in treatment are associated with worse outcomes. For patients in whom sepsis is possible, but the patient is very ill, the patient, for example, is in shock, the guidelines likewise recommend administering antimicrobials immediately, ideally within one hour of recognition. And that is because these are the patients that are too sick to guess wrong. And so unless you have a very clear um, sort of alternative diagnosis to explain their illness, um, because delays are so important in these sicker patients, um, the guidelines recommend administering antimicrobials immediately, ideally within one hour, and of course, continuing to look for infectious and non-infectious causes of illness and stopping those antimicrobials if it turns out that the patient has a non-infectious cause for their illness. For patients where sepsis is possible but the patient is less ill, the guidelines recommend a rapid assessment of infectious and non-infectious causes of illness with a goal to administer antimicrobials within three hours if the concern for infection persists after this further um, evaluation. Um, I will close there and would like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Um, it's been a pleasure. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott, it's with us today, and uh, so we do have some questions for you, uh, Dr. Prescott. Uh, first, the question, uh, uh, can we limit the start? First, co congratulations on the paper. I, I know it already, and it's a wonderful piece uh, for all the PROCON debates of early use of antibiotics. So thank you so much for the, the nice job you have done with this. So uh, the question is, uh, sh can we uh, deal with this overuse of antibiotics? Can, can it be uh, limited by starting with simple uh, of uh, 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 
simple antibiotics until the results of cultures are done. What do you think? Sorry, Flavia, I don't know that I totally no. follow the question. Yeah, the question is, uh, let me put it in another way. Uh, we are advocating for broad spectrum antibiotics. So the question is that uh, this overuse of antibiotics, this hypothetical overuse of antibiotics, uh, can we limit this if we just start with uh, less uh, broad antibiotics and then change after we have the culture results? Can yeah. this be part of the stewardship? Oh, yeah, right. So great question. Yeah. So how do we, you know, sort of, you know, balance rapid appropriate treatment of sepsis with trying to limit antibiotics? And I think that there are sort of a number of different ways that this can be done. Um, I think the first is this, you know, this first moment of, you know, do you make, you know, do you initiate antibiotics on the patient and trying to, you know, um, sort of balance, uh, you know, your assess, you know, the diagnosis and then how sick the patient is. Um, but then I think step two is you're exactly right, you know, reassessing every single day as we accrue more information. Um, and so, you know, that's why the guidelines recommend for patients who are really sick, we know that we are going to be potentially treating patients that ultimately it's wrong, but we have to, we have limited diagnostic tools at the moment. Um, and so we have to, you know, sort of make our best judgment. We have to treat, we get more information the next day. Um, and so part of sort of, I think, good sepsis care is treating people up front and then narrowing and de-escalating, stopping antibiotics, kind of continuing to reassess that um, diagnosis. If it turns out that it's something else, stopping those antibiotics. So just to pick the question as it is on the chat, uh, Heli, uh, you are saying that we should start with broad spectrum and then de-escalate. Because the question is, should we try to escalate? You see, we start with limited spectrum antibiotics. Oh, and then I just see what you're escalate. saying. You see? So the question is, it is a good stewardship practices to start with narrow, narrow spectrum antibiotics and the, then escalate after we have the culture results. This is, I think this is the point of the question. I see. Okay. I didn't follow it completely. Yeah. So I understand that question now. Um, I guess I would be hesitant to recommend that. I think that generally you want to take your local epidemiology as much as you have that. So if that's your hospital or that's your state or that's your country, to say based on the sort of signs and symptoms, what is the most likely site of infection? And then based on kind of whatever epidemiology you have kind of available using that to guide your treatment. I would be hesitant to just sort of start narrow um, because then you may miss what you're trying to treat. So I think generally we go broader and then as we get more information and can rule things out, we try to, you know, remove antibiotics as soon as possible. Yeah, great. And I also have a question for you, uh, Kelly, uh, because we, we're having discussions about your paper and uh, the paper of Dr. Liu a lot. And one of the criticisms that people have is because the timing, the reduction in the timing for antibiotics was uh, too small, or maybe it was too small to really represent a uh, potential impact because you were, you were too good on your network and your system. So it was quite difficult to reduce the time of antibiotics. And so the, the impact might be just small because uh, the improvements in the timing of antibiotics was also small. Can you comment on this? Oh, yeah. I mean, so I think that when you hear nine minutes, that might sound small. But when you multiply nine minutes every single year over a study period, that becomes this average that's closer to 40 minutes. And then there's variation around that. So there are hospitals out there that on average, for all their patients with sepsis, decrease time to antibiotics by an hour. Um, and this is, you know, the, the, the study cohort only looked at people that were, you know, sepsis was sort of defined in that study by being treated within 12 hours. So um, I think that that's actually a huge difference um, to get a whole, you know, essentially hundreds of thousands of patients treated um, on average 37 minutes faster in the end of that study compared to the beginning. So, you know, I think that, yeah, when you break it down on the year on year trend, it's not that big. When you add it up over time, it kind of amounts to a lot. And actually, what I think is the main message of our paper is that it is possible yes. to do this without without uh, 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 using more antibiotics if you have a good stewardship. So the last question is, it is possible 
but it's possible on Michigan, on your network. Is it possible everywhere? What should people do to get this sort of stewardship that you have on your network? Yeah, so I will say this, I mean, the, the nationwide VA, you know, system includes a, t- yeah, a whole oh, yes. range yeah. of different hospitals, right? So these are some, you know, tiny little hospitals and large academic medical centers. So it, you know, it did have a fair amount of variation. Um, but yes, I mean, the systems have invested in this. So I think that you're, you're exactly right. The main message is that this is possible. Um, it's also still possible that, you know, the opposite could happen. So essentially, I think you need to monitor antibiotic use um, to sort of understand what is happening um, and just be be mindful of that. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Prescott. It was a pleasure to have you with us to answer these questions at the, at the end of your talk. And it was a wonderful paper and a wonderful talk. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to move on for the next speaker. Uh, now we are going to discuss the intravenous use of vitamin C in sepsis. Uh, we are going to share with you the results of the LOVIT study. Uh, the LOVIT study is going to be presented by Dr. Francois Lamontagne. He is uh, a uh, uh, clinical care specialist and a clinician scientist by the University of Sherbrooke and the Center of Research in Sherbrooke. Uh, he has received many funds uh, to do research in Canada, uh, and his research activities uh, may focus on this uh, big clinical trials in resuscitation interventions and also in knowledge transferring uh, uh, from guidelines. So let's let's have Dr. Lamontagne with us. Hello. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to present to the World Sepsis Congress today. My name is François Lamontagne, and it's a, a pleasure to, to be with you, albeit uh, virtually. I'm presenting today on behalf of a large group of uh, individuals. Uh, first and foremost, my colleague and the co-principal investigator of the Lovett trial, Neil Ajekari. And you will recognize the names of many of our illustrious um, international steering committee members. We undertook the Lovett trial because we felt there was a strong rationale for vitamin C use in sepsis. It is a well-known antioxidant that, uh, in our view, and um, according to many experts, had the potential of mitigating oxidative stress in sepsis and thereby reducing the risk of death um, and organ dysfunction. We were also quite sensitive to the fact that uh, you know, uh, sepsis has a huge burden globally, <clears throat> uh, in particular in low and uh, middle income countries, and that uh, anywhere uh, we lack an effective uh, therapy specifically uh, shown to modulate the pathway to organ injury and death. And that vitamin C was uh, not only a, a seemed not only like a good candidate, but also a candidate that would be inexpensive enough to be useful uh, globally. And it seemed like an innocuous therapy and that could do no harm. Um, so, uh, and uh, but in addition, uh, and perhaps because uh, of this, vitamin C use was increasing rapidly uh, globally. This is a, one study from uh, uh, colleagues <clears throat> In the, in, the, in the United States showing that after 2016, vitamin C use increased drastically uh, and quite possibly continued to increase. Um, and we felt that although you know, we were enthused by the uh, possibilities um, of vitamin C, we felt that any therapy, however innocuous it may seem, must be appropriately, adequately studied in adequately powered clinical trials uh, before it's given, um, you know, to to human patients, and since it was becoming increasingly used, we felt it was uh, urgent to to study it well. So we launched a standard uh, placebo-controlled RCT across uh, thirty-five sites in Canada, France, and New Zealand to evaluate the effects of high-dose intravenous vitamin C compared to placebo in patients uh, treated in the ICU for sepsis and who were also uh, receiving vasopressors. Uh, 
we included patients who were 18 years and older uh, who were admitted to the ICU specifically for sepsis, whether or not at baseline uh, infection was uh, proven. As you know, uh, the confirmation often uh, comes a little bit later. Uh, and we enrolled patients who were hemodynamically unstable and already receiving vasopressors at baseline. We wanted to treat patients really early in the course of their illness, and so we excluded anyone who had been in the ICU for longer than 24 hours. And for safety reasons, we excluded patients with known G6PD deficiencies, uh, allergies to vitamin C, um, a history of kidney stones, and we excluded patients already treated with high-dose vitamin C, those who were expected to die within 48 hours um, in spite of uh, full life-sustaining therapies, uh, pregnant women, and patients who had already been enrolled in Lovett or a competing trial. The intervention was um, high-dose intravenous vitamin C, and this um, uh, was, uh, was defined as um, boluses of 50 milligrams per kilogram of vitamin C administered every six hours. Um, and um, ascorbic acid was mixed in um, dextrose and 5% dextrose or normal saline. And we, we gave these boluses every six hours for uh, four days. Um, patients in the control arm received a matching placebo that was prepared locally by uh, blinded uh, by unblinded pharmacists, but who were not involved in the patient's uh, clinical care. Every other intervention was left uh, at the discretion of the treating team, including steroids uh, and thiamine. The primary outcome for this study was a composite outcome of death and persistent organ dysfunction at 28 days. Persistent organ dysfunction is defined as the continuing uh, receipt of vasopressors, invasive mechanical ventilation, or renal replacement therapy um, at 28 days. Secondary outcomes were uh, days without organ dysfunction up to day 28, mortality alone uh, without the rest of the composite outcome at day 28 and at six months, health-related quality of life at six months, um, as well as SOFA scores, uh, and a number of biomarkers that we measured to uh, evaluate tissue dysoxia, inflammation, infection, uh, and endothelial injury. And we also carefully tracked three pre-specified safety outcomes, uh, stage three acute kidney injury, acute hemolysis, and hypoglycemia. The trial was monitored by an independent data safety and monitoring board composed of uh, professors um, Andreas Lopakis from Canada, Scott Halpern from the United States, and Lauren Griffith from uh, Canada as well. They reviewed interim analyses after we enrolled and obtained data from 248 and then 525 patients. And on both occasions, uh, they uh, recommended that we continue the trial without uh, modification. Um, and um, in terms of results, um, we enrolled between November uh, 2018 and July uh, 2021, a total of 872 patients. Uh, but because we um, enroll patients very early on, uh, following a, a deferred consent model, uh, some of those eight of those patients were actually ineligible and were uh, appropriately excluded according to pre-specified criteria after uh, duplicate adjudication. And so we were left with an intention to treat population of 864 patients one of whom withdrew consent, um, and therefore we report today uh, the analysis of data from 863 uh, patients. Baseline characteristics were well balanced uh, in terms of age, um, severity of illness uh, measured by the Apache 2 score, um, in terms of uh, SARS-CoV-2 status, um, vitamin C baseline levels, and uh, baseline use of the main um, co-interventions, such as uh, glucose steroids and mechanical ventilation, as well as um, vasopressors, which were, by definition, used in all patients and baseline. 
we carefully monitored um, adherence to the intervention um, and the vast majority, nearly all patients got uh, uh, over 90% of all scheduled doses. Uh, and we continued to track during the trial the receipt of uh, co-interventions such as steroids and thiamine, which remained uh, similar in both groups uh, until the end of the trial. After uh, completing a uh, 28-day follow-up, uh, and these are the main results, we found, uh, to our surprise, that vitamin C increased the risk of death or persistent organ dysfunction at 28 days. And this result um, uh, adjusted only for sight, uh, because randomization was stratified by sight, uh, was statistically significant uh, according to the pre-specified analysis plan. Individually, the components of the composite outcome uh, were not statistically significant, but the results of each uh, uh, component was definitely consistent with the main analysis uh, with uh, uh, seemingly similar differences looking at death alone and each of the other um, uh, life-supporting therapies. Most of the events in the composite outcome were driven by death, however. The uh, On the left of the slide, you will see the survival curves showing that the two groups uh, separated fairly early on uh, and never crossed uh, until uh, completing the um, study follow-up uh, up to six months. And we also tested a number of uh, well, the following uh, subgroup, uh, potential subgroups, which were all pre-specified and defined by age, sex, uh, uh, frailty at baseline, uh, sepsis-3 definition of septic shock, uh, predicted risk of death according to Apache 2 scores, baseline vitamin C levels, and SARS-CoV-2 status. And none of the um, pre-specified um, subgroups uh, were suggested any um, incredible subgroup effect uh, after adjudication using Iceman um, criteria. We uh, report um, consistent, but uh, uh, not statistically significant differences in, um, um, in, in terms of the number of days without organ dysfunction, uh, six month uh, mortality and um, health related quality of life at six months. Um, so again, although each of these outcomes were not individually statistically significant, the differences were consistent with the uh, primary results uh, measured at 28 days. Um, we also found no differences in the uh, safety outcomes that we monitored up to the end of the trial. Uh, uh, neither did we find differences in SOFA scores or in any of the uh, biomarkers um, um, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so in closing, um, uh, in this trial of 872 patients, um, we found that uh, vitamin C increases the risk of death and persistent organ dysfunction. This was an unexpected finding uh, of harm. Um, the secondary analyses to date uh, do not provide a clear explanation as to what is the underlying mechanism of this effect. We are continuing to evaluate uh, the secondary data and the uh, stored um, um, biological specimens, but uh, until now we have found no clear um, mechanism for this uh, effect. Uh, but it reinforces our conviction that any therapy, however innocuous it may seem, uh, must be uh, carefully evaluated in the context of an adequately powered uh, RCT before it is used in practice. Uh, we are in debt, uh, and we would like to thank uh, the clinical staff that um, made this trial possible, as well as all the patients and families who um, uh, took part in this uh, trial. <clears throat> Uh, and I thank you for allowing me to present uh, here today. We want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lamantenia, for this wonderful talk, the impact of your trial uh, uh, with all the evidence that we have now. 
for vitamin C was quite was quite important for the adequate non-use of this work. And we want to move forward to the next speaker, which is gonna be uh, Dr. Naomi Haymond. Uh, she we're gonna talk about the use of balance or or uh, sideline on patients with sepsis. And uh, Dr. Hammond is a, uh, a postdoctoral research fellow and research manager of the Clinical Care and Trauma Division at the George Institute for Global Health in Sydney. She also works uh, as an intensive care clinical research manager, manager at the Royal North Shore Hospital uh, in Sydney. She has been publishing a lot uh, on sepsis and on clinical care uh, in general. She has been uh, receiving many uh, grants for doing this, and she holds a number of other appointments that includes, and it's not restricted to, being the vice chair of the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Society Clinical Trials Group and the editorial board of the Australian Clinical Care, uh, which is the official journal for the uh, Australian College of Clinical Care Nurses. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Hengman. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to present today at the World Sepsis Congress. I apologise that I can't attend in person. I wasn't able to uh, make it this morning, but I believe uh, my co my chair, uh, Flavia Machado, should be able to answer some of the questions that you might have uh, in relation to this work as we have uh, collaborated together on a number of the, um, the papers. Uh, so I'm Naomi Hammond. I'm the program lead of the Critical Care Division at the George Institute for Global Health. And I also work at uh, the Royal North Shore Hospital in the ICU as a clinical research manager. I am part of uh, Sepsis Australia as a senior research fellow and hold other appointments. And today I'm pleased to be able to present on balanced crystalloids or saline for sepsis. As uh, conflicts of interest, oh, my slides are not working. There we go. Uh, my conflicts of interest um, in relation to this work are uh, that I am a investigator on the PLUS study, which was a, a fluid study comparing different types of crystalloids for fluid therapy. And also my employer, the George Institute, has received um, um, research funding from companies that produce intravenous fluids. So if we think about uh, fluid resuscitation research over the years, it's, it's been a perennial uh, debate and, and question around what types of fluids are best for critically ill patients and those with sepsis. And it's been really ongoing for more than two decades. And it started with comparative effectiveness trials uh, that compared uh, colloids to crystalloids, notably the SAFE study, which really uh, brought forward our critical care uh, trials um, uh, with, with this large uh, uh, comparative effectiveness trial uh, and it compared saline and albumin and then subsequent trials uh, looked at different types of colloids, uh, specifically uh, starch solutions. And then approximately uh, 10 years ago, observational work uh, began to emerge uh, that suggested that high chloride uh, content, the high chloride content of saline uh, could be adversely affecting our patients and that lower chloride solutions such as balanced salt solution or buffered salt solution would be the preferential choice. And so when we undertook some cross-sectional studies of fluid types, uh, looking at resuscitation episodes used in, in ICUs globally, that being the safe trip study and the fluid trip study, and compared how fluids had changed uh, in respect to the type of fluids that were being used for resuscitation between 2007 and 2014, we saw that there was a clear shift away from the use of colloids, which were the predominant uh, resuscitation type of fluid choice in, in 07, to that being crystalloids more commonly being used. And if you look at the actual types of crystalloids that were used, in 07, it was predominantly saline, and then this changed to uh, be predominantly balanced salt solutions in 2014. And this was regardless, this change had occurred regardless of that, um, that there really wasn't any head-to-head -head comparative trials of these fluids in critically ill patients or those with sepsis. 
And now RCTs have uh, been conducted, uh, starting with the split trial in, in published in 2015, uh, through to the more recently published basics and plus studies, which have now provided evidence to the comparative benefits of saline versus balanced salt solutions. So let's have a look and walk through some of these, uh, these uh, trials that have contributed data uh, to this uh, research question. So the split cost of randomised trial compared plasmolite 148 to saline in just over 2,000 critically ill patients in four ICUs in New Zealand. And they reported no difference in the effect of the two fluids on their primary outcome, which was acute kidney injury or failure or in the treatment of uh, renal replacement therapy, nor in mortality uh, at um, hospital, uh, in hospital um, mortality. Now, we need to remember that this was a pilot trial that was not powered to detect, more, detect a mortality uh, difference, and it really didn't provide us with a definitive evidence about the possible benefits or harms of balanced uh, solutions compared to saline. Uh, the split trial also looked uh, at sepsis as a subgroup and it's displayed here and, and there was no evidence that was, there was heterogeneity or treatment effect between fluids on the risk of acute kidney injury. So moving forward uh, to the publication of the SMART trial, which was an open labelled multi-cluster crossover RCT in five ICUs in a single hospital in the US. They compared the use of normal saline versus the balanced salt solutions, uh, lactated ringers or plasmolite. And these fluids could be chosen at the discretion of the treating clinician. The fluids were used for resuscitation and they recruited close to 16,000 uh, patients. The primary outcome was the composite of death from any cause, new renal replacement therapy or persistent renal dysfunction at 30 days. So that is make 30 with balanced crystalloids resulting um, in a significantly lower rate of major adverse kidney events compared to saline. So this was our first trial that showed that there was a benefit of balanced salt solutions uh, compared to saline on, on reducing major adverse kidney events, which included mortality. The individual components of, of that of make 30 are displayed on this screen and you can see they didn't reach statistical significance on their own. The effect of MAKE30 was also examined in a number of pre-specified subgroups, and the effect was strongest in patients with sepsis. I've highlighted that here in the red uh, square, uh, although the test for heterogeneity just fell short of the traditional level of statistical significance. There was clearly a trend towards the benefit of balanced salt solutions uh, on reducing MAKE30 compared to saline. Now, the, um, it's important to recognise that the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines were updated uh, and published in 2001, and this was prior to the release of, of the, the new data from Basics and Plus, but they did change their recommendation from using either balanced crystalloids or saline for resuscitation to recommending to use balanced crystalloids instead of saline for resuscitation in sepsis and septic shock patients. This was rated as, as weak, low quality evidence. So let's have a look at the new trials that have been published since the updated uh, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines, that being basics and plus. The basics uh, randomized control trial compared saline versus plasmolite 148 for all fluid therapy uh, episodes, including resuscitation, in just over 11,000 critically ill patients that were recruited from 75 ICUs in Brazil. The primary outcome was 90-day mortality and the Kaplan-Meier uh, survival graph is, is presented here. But there was no statistical significant difference on 90-day mortality between the two fluids. Looking at the predefined subgroup of sepsis, and it's highlighted in the red box, there was no evidence of heterogeneity of treatment effect between the two fluids on the 90-day mortality. Now for the PLUS study, uh, which was published uh, last year, this is a randomised control trial comparing plasma light 148 to saline in just over 5,000 patients. And these patients were recruited from 40 ICUs in Australia and New Zealand. 
There was no difference on 90 day mortality between the two fluids as evidence in the uh, graph displayed here on the screen, the kappa my curve. And looking at the predefined subgroups of sepsis, there was no difference of, uh, it, there was no evidence or no difference uh, between the two fluids. So, so no evidence of uh, heterogeneity of treatment effect in uh, the sepsis patients on the 90 day mortality. So what we did, uh, the authors of those major trials collaborated on a trial level, systematic review and meta-analyses, and we, we pulled the, the new data from BASICS and PLUS with the previous data published in this area. And this work was published uh, simultaneously with PLUS. The PLUS was in uh, the New England uh, Journal of um, Medicine, but uh, this uh, systematic review is in the new NEGIM evidence uh, journal and can be found there. There were 13 trials that were eligible for inclusion in the meta-analysis with a total of 36,000 participants contributing. And we specifically looked at balanced um, crystalloids versus saline in critically ill patients. The primary outcome that we chose was 90-day mortality in those trials that were deemed to be low risk of bias. There were 13 of the, there were six, sorry, of the 13 uh, trials adjudicated as having a low risk of bias and contributed data to the, um, the primary outcome. And there was the majority of the participants were included. So that was uh, uh, 34,450 participants. The 90 day mortality uh, pooled estimated risk ratio for balanced salt solutions compared to saline was 0 0.96 with a 95% confidence interval ranging from 0 0.91 to 1.01. .01. Now all of, um, we, we undertook, uh, so that there was a primary uh, uh, primary analysis uh, as uh, represented there, and we undertook uh, other um, uh, sensitivity analyses uh, to, to really um, determine the robustness of our estimate. And the sensitivity analyses also included a Bayesian uh, meta-analysis. What we can see here is that the effect estimate, so all of the, the risk ratios were consistent with the primary uh, analysis method that we used. And this included the Bayesian meta-analysis using vague prize, which is the last um, box displayed here at, uh, in the table, uh, which also shows the risk ratio of 0 0.96 in credible intervals uh, ranging uh, between 0 0.88 to 1.0. And using the grade criteria for assessing the certainty of evidence, the authors had high certainty that the primary outcome, in the primary outcome, and that the, the true estimate of effect lay within those confidence intervals that were reported. We also undertook a Bayesian meta analysis, as, as mentioned, uh, using vague priors. And this uh, is the cumulative probability plot that, uh, that comes from your Bayesian meta analysis. And this shows that there was an 89.5% probability that balanced salt solutions lower mortality by some degree compared with saline, with a risk ratio of 0 0.96, which was the point estimate that we achieved with the pooled data, the probability of balanced salt solutions reducing mortality by 4% drops to, to 50%. Now we looked at uh, the we pulled uh, trial level data for patients with sepsis in this meta analysis. There were five low risk of bias trials that contributed over six thousand seven hundred patients with sepsis. The risk ratios and confidence intervals were very similar to that of our main pooled results, with a pooled estimated risk ratio of zero point nine three and confidence intervals spanning from zero point eight six to one point oh one. So again, not statistically significant, but different, but appearing to favour balanced salt solutions in respects to the confidence intervals. So to answer the talk title question, uh, if we should use balanced crystalloids or saline for IV fluid therapy, the cumulative evidence from the low risk of bias trials uh, that have been recently published and pulled together would suggest that balanced salt solutions probably reduce mortality in patients with sepsis compared with saline and would likely be the preferential choice uh, for treating patients with sepsis and septic shock. 
So thank you for your time and I will hand now back to uh, the Chair Flavia and thanks again for the opportunity to present. That was really nice for Dr. Hammond. Uh, it's a wonderful paper and uh, it makes a lot of difference for us uh, having these results. And uh, as we are uh, a little bit uh, out of time, I just want to move on to our next and last speaker of this evening, Dr. Ivo Douglas. Uh, Dr. Douglas is a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado and chief of the pulmonary and clinical, med clinical care medicine at Denver Health Medical System. Uh, he has uh, graduated in South Africa, uh, has his training on uh, London in Great Britain and then moved to the United States. And now he's the principal investigator of many ongoing investigations on the clinical care field, both on sepsis, ARDS, long-term outcomes, uh, has received a lot of grants and a lot of uh, awards. So please very welcome, Dr. Dongler. You're going to present uh, our, uh, the last study, that's uh, the Clover study, that made a huge impact in our uh, knowledge about uh, sepsis resuscitation. Thank you. Dr. Machado and the organizers, uh, most sincere thanks. So for those of you in Europe, if you are watching this live, you have my sincere appreciation and respect for hanging out till midnight. In the next 12 minutes, we'll briefly review uh, the primary findings of the large randomized perspective trial in fluid and pressure management of patients with sepsis. We've had the benefit of several talks prior to mine discussing the epidemiology and other aspects of early resuscitation. And so for the purposes of, of the discussion today, I think it's important just to contextualize that we have uh, uh, reached a point of equipoise when it comes to fluid and presser use in the early phase of resuscitation. We clearly are aware from the triad trials that in patient level meta-analysis, there seemed to be no difference in survival for patients treated with a protocol-driven or usual care approach. But at the end of the day, what we had seen was a significant change in the volume of fluids administered between a usual care and protocolized care from the early um, uh, studies by Manny Rivers and others through to the period of the mid-aughts when the um, triad tri trials were conducted. And so whether we uh, put that together in meta-analysis or uh, in single case review, uh, we had determined that there was really some equipoise around the question of whether a more liberal or more conservative fluid strategy overall for the resuscitation of sepsis was indicated. Now, there are two major trade-offs that need to be considered. Strategies that prioritize a more restrictive approach, reduce overall fluids and balance, tend to treat with vasopressors earlier, and the intention is to prevent the, the progression of pathologic edema and sepsis-induced barrier dysfunction. And many observational studies, including from our group, have suggested a strong association between a net fluid positive balance and poor outcome. In contrast, liberal fluids uh, are beneficial because we think they augment preload. They potentially reduce the need for harmful vasopress administration at high dose, we believe that in most cases, they increase microcirculatory flow, although uh, ongoing work suggests that isn't always the case. And by far and away, the, this has been the current empiric approach. Now, why do we believe there's equipoise? Because the recent accumulation of large randomized trials, including the more recent uh, classic trial by Mayerhoff, and I'll show that study uh, from the outstanding Copenhagen group, uh, really draw the conclusion that when you uh, perform randomized trials of fluid liberal versus conservative approaches, that there may not be a net benefit in terms of survival. Now, the Mayo study was very important and imp different from the study I'm going to show you in a minute, was performed exclusively in ICU patients with septic shock and randomized patients to either standard fluid therapy or restrictive approach. And that protocol that was used resulted in a significant difference in the net fluid administration between those two groups without the resultant affecting uh, serious adverse events. Despite that, both in the Kaplan-Meier survival group and different study analysis, there was no significant difference in mortality. Similarly, there was no difference in pre-specified subgroups, uh, death and organ dysfunction uh, between the groups. But I'll draw to your attention that in an ICU cohort, a mortality of 42% was observed. 
The CLOVIS trial, which we conducted under the auspices of the NHLBI Paddle Network, asked a similar question of whether a liberal strategy or a restrictive strategy would improve sepsis-induced hyperperfusion and reduce mortality in a, a multi-center trial. We used a 90-day inpatient mortality and called the study to 2,320 patients um, as our primary objective. The study was published just in January this year as the, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so for the sake of uh, 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 being focused, I'd draw your attention to this publication for further details. The steering committee of the trial supervised the conduct of this uh, study over uh, the course of three and a half years, including during COVID. Uh, it was multi-center non-blinded. The intervention was a 24-hour fluid or vasopressor titration. And uh, we, we included a DSMB interim analysis at one third, two thirds, and a planned final uh, complete enrollment. The study was conducted at the 60 hospitals of the PETAL network in the United States. And our patients that we included were adults with a suspected or confirmed infection and evidence of persistent or hypoperfusion and hypotension after a minimum of a one liter fluid challenge. Now, the, the study aimed to be inclusive, but we excluded people who had been in the emergency room or who were identified already in the hospital after more than four hours since initially meeting inclusion criteria, or if the hospitalization had been for more than 24 hours total. If patients received three or more liters of fluid, they're excluded. Or if they had conditions uh, that were deemed not to be from sepsis or conditions of severe volume depletion, uh, other than the sepsis that would require large volumes of fluid administration or pulmonary edema, uh, these patients were also excluded. And similar to studies we've heard about uh, earlier in this session, important secondary outcomes related to organ failure and resource utilization. Now the protocol uh, included two structured arms for treatment. In the fluid restrictive arm, patients who were randomized um, had discontinuation of the continued fluids um, and uh, fluids up to two liters of total fluid, including pre-randomization were identified. We then used a blood pressure target to uh, initiate administration of norepinephrine to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 65 or better. And then we allowed rescue fluids in uh, limited circumstances where there was evidence of ongoing end organ tissue hyperperfusion or in the opinion of the clinician. In the liberal protocol, Patients were randomized and then uh, uh, received up to 2,000 cc's of additional fluid in one liter increments monitoring for uh, a pulmonary edema or hypoxia. This was real important because if a patient developed symptoms, uh, they did not continue the fluid loading step. We then uh, put them in a loop where boluses were used to maintain hemodynamics and presses were only used in the circumstance of uh, persistent hypertension uh, ongoing evidence of tissue hyperfusion and lactatemia, or if more than five liters of total fluid was administered. The major results of the study is that the um, enrollment was uh, stopped after 1,563 patients at our second interim analysis, and the determination was futility. The patients had, uh, that were involved included 780 randomized to the restrictive group and about 781 to the liberal group, and you'll note that there was about a 10% of total screen patients enrolled. The patients were well matched. They were moderately ill. They had uh, leukocytosis and 10% were ventilated at a baseline. Pneumonia was the most common cause. We had very high levels of protocol compliance at all stages of the study in both arms. And the patients were, were well matched uh, for age, gender, importantly, uh, race and ethnicity as self-declared, and for the concurrence of other important co comorbidities, diabetes, heart failure, and ESRD. The majority of our patients were located um, in the emergency room and were randomized within about an hour from meeting uh, eligibility criteria. And most importantly, most had received two whole liters of fluid by the time they were randomized, which is in that 30 mil per kilo range. And so importantly, this study does not specifically address uh, whether uh, primary volume bolus of less than 30 mils per kilo is beneficial or harmful. 
Importantly, that there were significant differences that the protocol drove in both the use of fluids and pressors. Let me show that to you graphically. The differences were stark at six and 24 hours and between the time of pre-randomization to 24 hours, the 2000 mil fluid difference from the bolus uh, was uh, persistent. And we note that the differences in fluids at six hours and 24 hours were most striking at the first six hours, but that there was still some preservation of that through 24 hours. Patients in our restrictive group receive vasopressors more often, earlier, and for almost twice as long as in the liberal fluid group. The primary outcomes I've alluded to was no difference in mortality. Let me again show you that the, diff the mortality was 14 and 14.9%, 14 very different from the classic trial of ICU only patients. And you'll note that the time to event analysis was no different. Similarly, there were no difference in any other organ failure free days or hospital utilization days. And other than some trends to numeric difference in mechanical ventilation, this was not significant. We had a number of secondary uh, endpoints that we were monitoring and there were no difference in any of these pre-specified subgroups, most notably chronic heart failure and ESRD, although numbers were very low. ICU admissions tended to be more common amongst those randomized to the restrictive group. And we believe in large part that was driven by the administration of vasoconstrictors as part of the protocol. However, we administered vasopressors peripherally and they were safe without an increased incidence of extravasation or complications. In conclusion, the fluid restrictor strategy as compared to fluid liberal did not result in lower or higher mortality. We think that a vasopressor centric or fluid restrictor resuscitation is equally effective. Fluid bolus administration in both arms was agnostic to fluid responsiveness. We've shown that peripheral IV administration of epinorepinephrine is safe, and we strongly feel that subgroup analyses or endotypes are going to be an important way to flesh out uh, any further utility in refining our therapeutic approaches. My thanks to the organizers, and if we have time, I'll defer to Dr. Bashara. Thank you so much, Dr. Douglas. It was a wonderful talk and a wonderful study. And as I said, it was classic and Clovis helped us a lot uh, in a, at the bedside. I uh, I do have a question for you. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, your study support the uh, principle of early use of vasopressors? I think our study shows that early that strategies that so, that deploy early vasoconstrictors including by peripheral IV route, are as safe and equally effective as fluid prioritized approaches. Now I say this realizing that uh, other work that we published emphasizes the importance of looking at dynamic fluid responsiveness measures to make the decision of when to give fluids. Now it's important to emphasize that although we didn't prevent uh, bedside clinicians using point of care ultrasound, dynamic fluid response testing, or other things, the use was very infrequent. And so I think that the answer to your question is vasopressor prioritization is safe and effective. And we think that there's further work to be done to understand how to then incorporate that in a more rational way. And do you think that this study uh, gave us a clue that it's uh, because the issue of using vasopressors earlier is the more you use vasopressors, more you're going to have the evidence effects related to the catecholamines. So do you think that you have power in your study to run out uh, the dangers of using more frequently facial pressures in volume? Yes, Flavia, I think we can say actually, and I, we've been very careful not to overinterpret the data, but you know the exposure to vasoconstrictors between the groups was very, very different. And one would hypothesize that given the enrollment size, that if there were going to be very uh, common adverse events, myocardial ischemia, neurocerebral injury, tissue ischemia, that uh, those would have been seen. Now, what I can say is that there may be rare other complications which are neurohormonal or otherwise that are much more subtle and have a longer time course to evolve that certainly warrant further consideration. But I am very comfortable with this approach as being comparable. 
And the, a last question uh, is that uh, regarding uh, the, 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 the arms of your study, uh, clovers have been criticized for having uh, very strict arms, meaning that uh, either the patient is too wet or the patient is too dry. So do you think that uh, as your study is a neutral study, maybe a more balanced approach, not going for one arm of your study or the other arm of your study might be the best solution, or we cannot say that? Uh, no, I don't think you can say that. I know, and just, I've heard the criticism, but you know, if we're going to conduct rigorous trials, we have to get separation. Now, could you have argued that you wanted what's called a usual care arm? Well, we would argue that the, the volume differences that we used were very much within the spectrum of usual care anyway. You're right that the groups are separated, but we did a lot of work previously that we published that shows that in normal care, fluid balances everything from the left to the right in terms of distribution. And so we're reasonably convinced, and I hope that we've convinced our reviewers, that uh, adding a, for example, usual care, do what you want arm would not have further informed our insights into this trial. I think truly we've shown that they have equal efficacy if all you worry about is blood pressure as a target. And I actually think strongly that thinking about whether you have residual fluid responsiveness and restoration of microcirculation are going to definitely be the next targets for our work. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Douglas. It was a wonderful talk, a wonderful paper. Congratulations on what have you done. And we are coming to the end of our session. Uh, we want to close this session uh, saying thanks everyone that is with us up to this time. Uh, remember everyone that uh, we do have uh, uh, to thank our sponsors uh, that uh, has helped a lot with their always support for the Global Sepsis Alliance into this whole uh, Global uh, World Sepsis Congress. Uh, I'm not seeing this slide here yet, now I am. Uh, uh, I also want to thank uh, you and ask you to listen to our lectures. They are going to be released uh, soon after uh, the end of this meeting, one by week, and also ask you all to sign the World Sepsis Declaration. And by closing this session, I want to invite our daughter, Ihana Melek. She will close uh, our meeting. Ihana, can you present yourself and go ahead? Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so very much um, to Dr. Machado and to the speakers for an excellent final session of the Congress. My name is Imran Amalek, and I am the co-chair for this fourth World Sepsis Congress, along with Dr. Tex Kasun, president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. What a fantastic Congress and um, brilliantly moderated, filled with such engaging speakers and topics. The Congress has had over 100 speakers plus moderators um, from over 30 countries bringing their expertise to us over the last two days. A heartfelt thank you to all, especially our wonderful viewers, over 15,300 of you. The title of this Congress is One Global Health Threat, Sepsis, Pandemics, and Antimicrobial Resistance. Our moderators and speakers expertly led us through these guiding points where we heard discussions and themes related to the One Health concept on reducing health system inequities between high and low middle income countries and within the countries themselves, on understanding the impact of social determinants of health on sepsis, and on the broader context of how climate change impacts healthcare today. We heard how the costs of sepsis are routinely underestimated with an astounding $57.5 billion in costs in the US alone based on the 2019 data, which really underlines the need for us to start to pivot, as Dr. Small stated, um, in reframing health as an investment, not as a cost or a revenue discussion. We also heard from GSA's regional alliances whose advances have been in the form of collaborative research that has forwarded the understanding of sepsis in these regions. In learning from COVID-19 pandemic, we heard about novel biomarker technologies and how machine learning and precision, precision medicine can propel advances in timely diagnosis and treatment of sepsis. 
In addition, we saw how the importance of post-sepsis syndrome care is highlighted and underscored by our experience with long COVID. We heard from maternal health and pediatrics disciplines sharing the disproportionate burden of sepsis and AMR in these patients, and where challenges persist regarding what antimicrobials are appropriate in the setting of high AMR, a problem which studies such as Neosep are trying to clarify. And successes included the, in the example of maternal sepsis bundles in Malawi. We heard the heartfelt stories of sepsis survivors and families sharing how awareness and advocacy contribute to improvement in outcomes in children and in adults. And this was exemplified by the New York State study driven by Rory Stoughton Foundation and, and sepsis. As a new discussion for the first time in our one of our Congresses, we had um, a session moderated by Lord Grade from the UK where we heard how we can better communicate about sepsis, especially in low middle income countries. And finally, as we just heard, we had uh, discussions about some of the most recent and impactful studies regarding sepsis care. Now these wonderful presentations could not have been possible without the tremendous efforts of the Congress organizing committee, the GSA administrative team and the team at NS NC3 to whom I extend my gratitude. A special thank you to Dr. Conrad Reinhardt founder and past president of GSA, and Dr. Tex Kassoon, current president of GSA, for their inspirational work and leadership in steering this GSA as well as this Congress. A particular thanks to our sponsors, whose support has helped bring this Congress to fruition. Finally, a reminder to the audience, um, similar to what Dr. Machado shared, that all the sessions will be available on YouTube and in podcasts starting on May 2nd. Please follow us on the GSA website and on our social media platforms for more details on the rollout of the sessions. And with these words, we conclude the fourth World Sepsis Congress. But as always, this is certainly not the end of this conversation. We hope to see you again soon. And that's a plug for the World Sepsis Congress Spotlight slated for April 2024. We encourage you to keep advocating with GSA to improve lives from sepsis for a vision of a world free of sepsis. Thank you all and be safe.